Yes, the first session is on infrastructure and utilities, and um, it's, it's nice to see so many of you joining us. Uh, I know yesterday was a successful day, and I enjoyed the sessions I saw. Um, so I'm going to hand over immediately to um, Musa Musa uh, from the um, Institute Pasteur in Senegal. Musa is a postdoctoral virologist working in um, the virology department in uh, the Institute Pasteur de Dakar. His main, he's, he has a one health approach to his uh, virology and his main study uh, fields are arbovirus and hemorrhagic fevers and with a major focus on next generation, generation sequencing for pathogens. He's been involved in the management of several outbreaks, the yellow fever outbreak in the DRC, uh, Ebola outbreaks and uh, management of sequencing for different in, in the Pan-African Institutes of uh, Institutes Pasteur. Uh, in relation to COVID. He, and he's the labs, uh, lab scientist coordinator for the ALERT co consortium. So without hesitation, I'll hand over to Musa and let him uh, get on with his presentation. As um, Mag said, at the end, there'll be a question and answer session and we'll do, drive that through the, the chat function on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the Zoom call. Thank you, over to you, Musa. Thank you very much, team. And uh, so, uh, morning to everyone. So, I'm gonna start by this uh, presentation about uh, the infrastructure and utilities. So, just give me. So, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to to be part of this workshop, and I hope you will enjoy this session. So, um, as part of a global health security initiative, uh, a cooperative threat reduction effort and the international development programs, sophisticated laboratories have been provided to uh, mitigate biological threats and bolster to countries' capacity for detection, diagnosis of, and storage of high consequence pathogens. As you know, um, laboratories are critical for supportive effective infectious disease surveillance and uh, outbreak response. Uh, so, and the lack of adequate laboratory capacity is a global challenge. However, they can sometimes be limited local technical capacity and capability, which can result in a high reliance on imported expertise, skills, equipment, and over resources. So sustainability can therefore be hard to achieve. So uh, we can say that we have four uh, topics say, sections, which are really essential. Uh, in terms of functional aspect to consider prior to embarking on establishing or proposing a laboratory. We have the financial aspect, the human resources, the operations, and the infrastructures and the utilities. Uh, suitable infrastructures and adequate access to utilities are also a fundamental requirement for laboratory sustainability. Uh, so consideration should be given to the most suitable location for the laboratory. Security measures need to be in place and the risk in terms of power supply, access to water, transport links and buildings, as well as environmental conditions. So uh, we must consider measures to be taken to mitigate uh, this risk. And the first ones are of course, biosafety and biosecurity. So the biosafety levels. We have two definitions which are really important. The biosafety, which is actually the containment principles, techniques, and practices implementing to avoid an intentional exposure to pathogens or toxins or the accidental release. And we have also the biosecurity, which is the protection, the control, and the accountability for valuable biological materials in laboratory in order to restrict access and avoid loss, theft, misuse, diversion, or deliberate release. And as you all, all know, biological materials are, can be samples like blood, urine, tissues, secretions, and ETC, and which, is, which are in use in common in laboratories and research units and are a potential source of risk, sometimes identified, but more often, most often unrecognized and difficult to assess. And we have the microorganisms including those which are genetically modified, like you have the cell cultures, the human endoplast, capable of causing infection, allergy or intoxication. 
And we have the notion of biological risk, which is the probability of being exposed to a biological hazard in a dietary way, with an agent triggering the disease, with the case of the microorganisms, and the indirectly uh, exposition by a toxin. And when we talk about microorganisms, you have uh, different groups of uh, biological agents, which are uh, defined, I would say, by the pathogenicity of the, this biological agent, by the risk of uh, illness or exposition, by the risk of spread in the community, or by the existence of a prophylaxis or an effective treatment. So very quickly, you have this classification of a biological agent. Uh, you should probably know. Um, in the group one, we have those, uh, which you, we have a microorganism where for which one we don't have any uh, report of disease in humans. We have a case of adenovirus, for instance. The groups two, which can cause illness in humans and be dangerous for workers, but the spread is unlikely. We have a case of a staphylococcus aureus uh, or sometimes uh, some hepatitis. We have uh, group three, which can cause serious illness in humans. It, it can pose a serious danger to workers and for which one the spread in the community is possible and for which one we have not have uh, effective prophylaxis, uh, but we have effective prophylaxis or treatment. And if you can see, you see where we have the actual SARS-CoV-2, which fall within this fraud group, even one could uh, put in, in the level four as there is no clear effective treatment so far. So we, we end with the group four, which are the microorganisms which can cause serious illness, uh, a high risk of spread in the community, and which, for which one we don't have any prophylaxis or effective treatment like uh, Lassa virus, uh, criminal hemorrhagic fever, and uh, overall hemorrhagic fever viruses. So this is the different types of facilities uh, for the management of these pathogens. We have a different type of laboratory with different uh, containment level. We have a basal one, which is a room ventilated uh, and uh, We've been insulated by a door and closed window, and which is easily washable benches, benches, walls, and floors. And so we just need a uh, protective clothing uh, and clean, uh, tidy meat. And you will need to respect uh, the most basic GLP. We have a BSL2, which have a BSL1 plus a regulated uh, access for a typical uh, spe for, uh, specified personnel. Uh, and so we have a upgrade of uh, BS1, BLS1 level. We, are, we need PPE like uh, gloves, glasses, or use of needle box. And you have, of course, the, the microbiological safety cabinet, uh, which is actually a MSC1, uh, where the manipulator and the environment are protected by the creation of respectively an airflow entering the cabinet and the filtration of the air through a very high efficiency filter. While the product being under these unprotected systems comes into contact with laboratory air. Um, we have a BSL-3, which is actually a BSL-2 plus an air lock, a filtration in incoming and outgoing air. Uh, we have an intercom, which is of course optional. We have a negative pressure with an alarm system, a generator and shower. You use here an MSC2, a microbiological safety cabinet tool, uh, uh, which allows the protection of the end material by a dome, a world flow of hair previously filtered through a very high efficiency filter. And we finish with a BSL4, uh, which is a BSL3 plus the emergency ventilation system, an intercom, which is mandatory, which is uh, compulsory, and you have a double hairlock, a shower compulsory. And we use here a MSC3, where the project is handled by means of flexible uh, sleeves ending in globes. And the environment is protected by filtration of the air in the chamber through two filters in series with very high efficiency, and there is no contact of the internal part of the cabinet with laboratory air. So we have several different um, facilities, uh, depending on the of, of, um, microorganisms you are, uh, you are working on. So it's basically the workspace organization under the MEC with uh, a, a workspace organization uh, with a clean uh, work 
and the contaminated areas clearly separated, as all, uh, all, everyone knows. So just to note that you, uh, I will invite, I'm inviting you to read this WHO manual about the laboratory biosafety manual, which is very complete and which will cover all points already discussed and more of us. Um, so about the biosafety levels, the facilities should be, uh, should have an appropriate size, structure and location with space to avoid contamination of samples with separation of activities, limited access, uh, the storage area with a controlled temperature, defined limits, alarm and backup, a, a good maintenance, of course. The second part will be the waste disposal pathways. Uh, with several points, we have some guidelines which are well established to minimize risk associated with the disposal of laboratory waste. We should minimize waste and do not accumulate large amounts in the lab. We should segregate waste, have a separate residue container if you are generating a large amount of any particle type of waste. So entry of a waste container is compatible with the waste you are collecting. You should label the waste residue container with appropriate waste label, of course. You should store waste in a suitable area prior to collection. You have, for, inst for instance, the chemical and solvent which will be stored in a ventilated area. And residue container uh, leads must be secure. You should handle waste only if you are aware of the hazards associated with the waste and appropriate risk control. Uh, dispose waste as per relevant uh, following the, the guidelines and record all disposal on waste tracking log to ensure evidence of correct waste management. So, so we have a waste disposal pathways uh, with um, actually the, the this common uh, schema with a waste which can be risk-free, which can be stored in the regular trash can. And we have uh, the, the waste which are at risk of infection, which can be liquid, uh, chemical, or, or solid. And all these ones should be decontaminated, decontaminated neutralized before uh, elimination. In uh, And we should use HDPE uh, containers uh, which are um, the most uh, the most uh, appropriate uh, container, as it's a high density polyethylene uh, containers before uh, incineration. In case you have uh, the specific case of, of chemical waste with limited value, so you can. Uh, this kind of waste can be disposed in sanitary sewer under certain conditions. So we have here uh, several uh, legislation. Uh, so if the material meets the, the some criteria, it may be flushed to the sewer with at least an equal volume of water. The material must have a hazardous material identification system, the HMIS, or a national national fire protection Associati association NFPA as with, uh, rating of no or one for health and fire and a rating of no for reactivity to be uh, to be able to be uh, flushed in the sewer so you see that you should know the specific characterization of your project so about the computerized laboratory managing management information system which is another part of your of the, the different aspect which should be taken into account here you have a diagnostic cycle, uh, which, as we said yesterday, are three main uh, parts: the pre-analytical phase from sample reception with the corresponding clinical information to recording on a database, the analytical phase during which one the required analysis are performed, and the post-analytical phase from the recording of the data generated during the previous phase to the release of the results. So you see that we have this important diagnostic cycle, but uh, we can see that with the improvement of epidemiological surveillance systems and diagnostic tools, the demand for tests is increasing and it's increasingly complex and critical to follow the diagnostic cycle in an organized and structured way. So this is why uh, a specialized integrated management software package ensure the main processes of a research laboratory, a medical analysis, analysis laboratory, or all types of laboratories. For example, it manages the field entry and traceability of samples, users, instruments, many of the automated systems, stocks and supplies, monitoring of 
projects and equipment as well as a patient record. So that's why the LIMS is really critical in order to automate to make the automatic um, receive speedless of a diagnostic uh, cycle. So far, what is the advantages of um, the laboratory management information systems? It permits to eliminate uh, the human error. So I would say that there's a lot of reason to go for this way. It's, um, as you say, the modern lab information system have the power to automate data and tasks on a single platform. This in turn reduces laborious manual efforts, saves time and reduces chance of human error in the lab. The real time tracking and time saving and in all time collection and transfer of samples comprising of registering outgoing samples and a registering incoming samples was a really time consuming activity. And the real time tracking of samples is also possible uh, for a technician uh, which can in the same time manage and control the complete workflow just by making a few clicks on his uh, computer. The conception based inventory alerts. So um, the inventory module in lab information system, the links can automate purchases. So automated purchases are now possible through predictive ordering and expiration alerts. Thus the, the complete process eliminates wastage controls uh, the, the pilferages, the cuts cost, apart from the most important factors of turning away clients due to non-availability of inventory. And uh, it helps for the quality control management. It becomes easy to, to keep good quality control records, perform analysis on quality control data and generate statistics automatically. Uh, it permits easier data searching and access to patient information. So a variety, a variety of uh, parameters can be used for data retrieval. It's uh, usually possible to access data by name, by laboratory or patient number, and sometimes by test result or analysis performed. And this kind of data searching is almost possible with paper. Uh, it, it was complete, not impossible, but complicated with paper-based systems. So the most computer system will allow access to all recent laboratory data for a patient. And this is very useful in the process of checking the most recent results against previous data to look for changes, which is a good practice and helps to detect errors. Uh, it permits an easier report generation of, and tracking. Of course, it's easy to generate detailed, legible reports quickly. Uh, so the links will provide standardized reports. And also a computer system make, I would say, uh, I would say, makes this report much easier to to track and to make, and uh, and and the data are really easier to be reviewed and reported. We have also the uh, the, finance, the, the financial management, which why we uh, can see that some limb system allow for management system for. For example, patient billing for a, a medi uh, uh, for a medical laboratory, laboratory, for instance. We have also the integration with sites outside the laboratories, and so the limbs can be set up so that data comes into the laboratory system directly from a patient or client registration point, and then data can be transmitted to many sites or interfaces as needed. So the results can be provided directly two computers uh, accessible to the healthcare provider or public health official. So the computers can handle data entry into a national laboratory database and almost any other uh, application that is needed. Um, I would say, I will show you uh, an example of uh, this type kind of uh, uh, integration with sites uh, within the, the, the country uh, with an example of Senegal. So, but there are some, uh, some disadvantages. So uh, some drawbacks with the uh, implementation of uh, limbs in a lab. We have the first one, which is the training. So personal training is required. And because of the complexity of limbs, this training can be time consuming and also expensive. The time to adapt to a new system, uh, of course, when starting up a, a computer system, it may seem inconvenient and, and widely to laboratory staff, as I said before the training. So personal accustomed to manual system, the old fashioned way may be challenged by such tasks as correcting errors and ascertain on of how to proceed when encountering situation where a feed must be uh, filled in. 
We are also the cost of course, because purchase and maintenance of are the most expensive part of a computerized system. And the cost can be prohibitive in some settings. Additionally, some settings will not have good maintenance that is locally available. And uh, so it will be sometimes really complicated to assure the sustainability of this kind of system. We have also the physical restriction. So uh, we need adequate space and dedicated electrical requirements mm -hmm. for a limbs, uh, as well as placement of a computer away from it, humidity and dust. And we are in Africa, so sometimes it can be complicated to, to, to find this kind of, uh, of place. We have a need for backup system, of course, as, all, as you know, all our computer information must be carefully backed up. A loss of data due to a damaged disk or system uh, crash cannot be tolerated and backup system will be uh, then critical. And there are a number of options available to those interested in developing a LIMS. We have a fully developed laboratory system, which is usually include computer software and uh, training. And we have an in-house computer network way, which uh, with locally developed system based on commercially available that um, database software. So in IPD, we opt for the second option. Um, so in IPD, we, we have this system, this ecosystem to call the Teranga, which is actually a digital platform in our institute with some components. We have so the limbs, uh, we have several modules uh, dedicated for epidemics or for specific research programs. Uh, and we have the Teranga mobile uh, collector, which is a platform allowing the creation and the reception of uh, um, information through mobile device. So this is rapidly uh, how the pipeline is for the COVID-19 management in IPT using the Teranga uh, platform. So information for provided by the patient or the suspected cases and the travelers are collected with a web, web interface or a mobile collector. The information is compared in a mobile collector server from which, uh, from which one data are transferred and stored in the Teranga server. And both lab tests and validated results are then added and automatically associated to the corresponding metadata and the final outputs are then transmitted to the client, which is the, the traveler or the physician using SMS notification. So that's how our uh, LIMS uh, is working actually for the COVID-19 management in IPD. And uh, this is actually uh, the, the functional architecture of uh, this LIMS with the patient information, uh, also the visualization, the quality assurance, or other uh, specific uh, tools like the molecular biology or virus viral isolation uh, modules taking into account in this uh, Teranga architecture. As an example, you have a dashboard for outbreak management. When we, and this uh, modular uh, was used during the, some outbreaks. This is the example of uh, the two previous dengue uh, epidemics that we occurred in Senegal. Uh, a few, few, few years ago, and the Ministry of Health was able to follow up the epidemic curve, the, sp the special temporal spread of cases and vectors on a map, and in real, in real time. So you see that the limbs was, was very useful for any part of any aspect of the lab management actually within the, the institute, and also when we are uh, deployed uh, on the field. So another prior point to uh, another point uh, topic is the, the calibration. How to make the calibration and how to, to calibrate the equipment by ourselves. So this is a this is a I would say definition from the International Vapor Laboratory of Microbiology uh, from the BIPM, which is actually in French. Uh, the Bureau International des Poids Mesures, which means the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, and for which one uh, calibration is, is an operation that under specified conditions in a first step establish a relation between the quantity values with measurement and certainties 
provided by measurement standards and corresponding education with associated measurement and uncertainties and in the second steps uses this information to establish a relation for obtaining a measurement result from an indication but basically it means that calibration is the act of comparing a device under test of an unknown value with a reference standard of a known value so this is uh, a very simple definition of uh, what is calibration. So in other words, the known value must have a clearly understood uncertainty to help the instrument owner or user determine if the measurement uncertainties is appropriate for the calibration. And so how do we arrive at measurement standard of known values against which we calibrate our uh, devices under test? So uh, for this answer, we turn to the International System of Units, abbreviated SI, which is uh, actually constituted of seven uh, basis SI units, which are derived from quantities in nature that do not change, with, such as the speed of light. So you have here the Planck uh, constant of the elementary charge uh, or over, over different uh, specific units. And what you should know that actually the BIPM is the coordinator of a worldwide measurement system and is tasked with answering worldwide unification of measurements. And a key benefit of having the BIPM manage uh, the SI on a worldwide basis is the calibration interoperability. This means that all around the world, we are using the same measurement system and definitions in order to have interop uh, interoperability. We need to have all of our measurement traceable to the same, same definition. And uh, the SI in this calibration traceability pyramid are the top of the calibration, uh, of, uh, on the top. And uh, the lineage from the lowest level of the calibration pyramid all the way up to the SI standard can be referred to the as traceability. And the BIPM helps pass the SI down to all level of use within countries for the fostering of scientific discovery and innovation, as well as industrial manufacturing and international trade. So just below the SI level, the BIPM works directly with the National Metrology Institute of member states or country to facilitate, uh, facilitate the promotion of SI within those countries. And because it's not affordable, efficient, or even possible for everybody within a country to work directly with the NMI, uh, moreover in Africa, NMI level calibration standards are used to calibrate primary calibration standards or instruments which are standard which high level of, pure, of uh, purity or low level of reactivity and the high level of um, high equivalent weight. After that, we have a primary standard which are then used to calibrate the secondary standards that are uh, substantially prepared in the lab, like uh, I would say sodium hydroxide for a specific analysis. Those um, secondary standards are used to calibrate working standards that are expected to, to deteriorate after a time period or use uh, context experts. And after, at the end, the working standards are used to calibrate the process instrument, which means that to, start to calibrate our uh, instruments in the, in the different labs. Uh, in this way, as illustrated in this, Im this image, uh, we have this SI standard, which can be efficiently and effectively passed down the calibration pyramid through the NMI. And so, we are doing for the calibration accreditation uh, uh, because when calibration are performed, it's important to be able to trust the process by which they are performed. And so the calibration accreditation means that a calibration process has been reviewed and found to be compliant with internationally accepted technical and quality methodology requirements. Uh, so uh, this accreditation uh, gives an instrument owner confidence that the calibration has been done correctly. And we have the ISO IEC 17.025, which is the International Metrology Quality Standard to which calibration laboratories are accredited. And we have several, uh, I would say, uh, independent organizations which are certifi certified to, uh, to do this type of, of work, uh, to, to do the accreditation services. We have an example in the United States of a National Voluntary Laboratory or in England with the United Kingdom accreditation systems. Uh, sorry, sorry. So 
when an instrument calibration can be a uh, code, when do we need calibration? So an instrument calibration can be code for uh, uh, can, when we have, what is, when it's new, when we have a new instrument, when a specified time period is elapsed, when a specified usage, meaning an operating hours has elapsed, when an instrument has had a shock of vibration, which potentially may have pulled it out uh, of calibration, when uh, we have not certain, certain changes in weather and whenever observation uh, appear and which mean, which can be uh, questionable. And how is a calibration performed? We have a couple of approaches to calibrate a, a device under test. It can, we can so conduct testing to verify that the instrument meets the in-house lab performance specification, meaning that we have already uh, in-house uh, standards. Or we, we can uh, conduct testing to verify that the instrument meets the manufacturer state specification, which is actually the most uh, easier way, I would say. And the, the, the calibration uh, need to focus on three main categories, the accuracy, precision, the technical aspect, and the environmental. I would just uh, go to the environmental, meaning that uh, we need to check about the thermal and mechanical shock, the transport pressure and storage, the vibration solar, the wind, the sand and dust, or uh, the ice accreditation, or uh, as well as the corrosion protection. So, I mean, uh, in Africa, it will be the most important thing, uh, as you know. And why calibration is important? Calibration uh, a permit to eliminate uh, waste in production, of course, such as records required by producing things outside of design tolerance. It permits to help identify, repair, or replace manufacturing systems components before they fail, avoiding costly downtime in a factory. We prevent uh, both the hard and soft cost of distributing a faulty product to consumers, and also with calibration, cost go down while safety and quality go up. So, periodic calibration is usually viewed uh, as a smart business investment with a high return on uh, investment. After, for the end, we talk about the contingency plans. So uh, contingency, contingency plan is a part of a risk management. So the contingency planning involves both preparing for predictable and quantifiable crises, and also preparing for unexpected and unwelcome events. The aim is to minimize the impact of variable events and to plan for how the structure will resume normal operation after the crisis. And we have here this table, which is actually a, a risk assessment uh, matrix with different levels of risk from the low acceptable uh, risk to, I would say, an extreme unacceptable one. So uh, we, have diff we have several steps uh, for making a contingency plans. We need to identify and prioritize the resources. So research and list the crucial resources, such as teams, tools, facilities, and prioritize that list from most important to least important. See what are the key risks, figure out where you are vulnerable by meeting with teams, executives, and every other department in the organization to get a full picture of what events could be compromised uh, your resources and hire an outside consultant if if necessary. So it could be a good idea to have an external point of view. You need to draft a contingency plan. So uh, if you can write write a contingency plan for each risk that you identified in the above steps, but start with what's most critical to the life of your organization. As time permits, you can create a plan for everything on your list. Whatever the plan you fought behind each should be the steps necessary to resume normal operation of the company. Thinking about communication, people's responsibilities, the timeline, timelines and, and extra. Share the plan, of course. And when you've written the contingency plan and it's been approved, the next step is to make sure that everyone in the organization has a copy. A contingency plan, no matter how far or how, is not effective if it haven't been properly communicated. So you need to disseminate it, your, your plan. And you need, of course, to revisit it, to revisit the plan 
Yeah, because a cottage plant isn't uh, it isn't uh, I would say chiseled in a, in a stone. It must be re revised uh, and maintained to reflect changes to the organization. So as new employees, technology, and resources enter the pictures, the contingency plan must be updated to handle uh, to handle them. So uh, we need to take taking into account the space planning. The, the, so the contingency planning can occur early in the, in the process of laboratory design, ensuring uh, you need to ensure that items like generators, gas tank placement, and research animal housing are not only secured but are uh, are not in areas that could be uh, prone to flooding, like basements. As you plan for those items, think about how quickly you can access them, maintain them, it's ATC. And if a disaster arises, uh, another laboratory layout uh, for includes installing the appropriate for suppression system. Excess water damage could make matters worse and cause damage on top of a fire. So you need to take to 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 think about space and uh, to be sure that you have uh, fire suppression systems also. The safety equipment. So in addition to the fire suppression system, it's critical to have general safety equipment available and up to code. You have you need to have fire extinguishers, first aid kit, electrical safety tools, and up to date training can help all staff lab staff uh, to be more aware and equipped to respond. Uh, to emergencies if they really arise. You need to have, of course, if possible, backup uh, equipment, even if it's compli sometimes complicated. Uh, and uh, of course, to be to be able to, to switch to another uh, equipment. The business continuity plan, so having a plan to put into, into account uh, in, uh, the recovery effort and strategy for resuming research or production a, a up-to-date emergency personnel, a backup vendor, and a regent inventory list are a great start to continue planning. So having backups for outsourcing lab work or a strategy for resuming work is also a good, uh, I would say, addition to your plan. Uh, you also having a pictures of all laboratory equipment and the associated purchase information uh, will be uh, a a guarantee of a safe uh, business health. You need to to involve your staff. So be, in being involved in contingency discussion will lead to stronger execution and support of backup procedures and more uh, confidence from the staff when the unexpected occurs. So uh, how can you involve staff? One way to help support operation after disaster is to have staff members that have been uh, proactively cross-trained in multiple areas. They will help ensure there is, uh, I would say, coverage in case personnel are unable to return to work or there are limited work areas that can be safely assessed. So a course uh, training record may be a valuable addition to a continuity plan and can provide a way to involve uh, staff in the planning. And I will, the last part will be the management by in, real management by in. Uh, so we've reviewed in a few, uh, ideas for laboratory backup planning, be someone from very inexpensive and uh, to over having some cost associated with them, with them. Because uh, staff, technology and space in the lab are constantly evolving, it's essential that your backup plan uh, be current and maintained. And while some backup planning strategy have little to no cost, as I said, some can have quite significant financial impact, but the risk versus the cost assessment may make them uh, worthwhile taking the time to assess your lab's unique needs and creating and implementing a backup plan to take into account a realistic cost benefits analysis is not only great for lab operation, but it's a great team building exercise. So as previously said, some important questions need to be pointing before a lab implementation and you have this, uh, this map or this uh, picture, we can resume it. And uh, so there is no uh, a typical way, but you need to manage with your field of uh, implementation and be uh, aware of every uh, potential issues which can occur. So I hope you enjoy it. And this is some references I used for the, this, this, uh, this talk and thank you to everyone. 
Thank you, Musa, for uh, a, a fascinating talk and uh, a very good overview of the whole process from laboratory through data management, uh, calibration, uh, the important point about calibration and finally contingency planning. So we now open this um, session to some questions. Um, if people could post the questions in the chat box, then we'll um, try and gather them together. Myself, uh, John Tembo and Pakom Abdul from Ga Gabon are also on the panel and uh, we'll try and capture the questions and also uh, chip in with, with um, our experience uh, to uh, inform the group. Um, Musa, thank you, that, that was really very good. One of the, there's a couple of areas around the limb systems which people have asked questions about. And um, the very first uh, thing is around data security. So in these times of data security, there's been, there was a question about uh, limb systems and data security and what the approach to data security is for these. Do you have any comments on that? Sorry, say it again, please. <laughs> so the question was about data security and limb systems and uh, what the okay. uh, answer to that is. Okay, that's a good, very good question. So yeah, uh, actually, I can just give an example of uh, in, in Institute Pasteur where uh, so usually uh, when you opt, I said you, you have two options for a lens. Uh, you can use, a, I would say, a, all, a, a package of uh, already built by a company. And we, in this way, you have already uh, the, the the security modules already involved, incorporated. So I would say, if you don't want a very complicated thing, you can just opt for that and you will be able, you should be able to have a good protection as this module is actually uh, implemented here. So, but if you want an in-house way, it will be more complicated. You need to choose the, the best option. And in I would say that in, in the market, you have several good uh, modules and you can also, uh, I would say build your own module systems by your way, but you need a very good team. Actually, I'm not a very good a specialist of these things, but uh, I would suggest when you start with a, when you are at the beginning to go for an already packed uh, system and you should be able to have a, a, a security modules in your, your games. Thanks, Musa. Several people. So one of the things, so I've been involved in a couple of projects to institute limb systems around um, sites in Africa, particularly with the Panacea project. And um, we've been working with a group from South Africa. In fact, there are national and international standards for data protection that um, most of the commercially supplied limb systems now, um, now follow. So they um, the EU stroke UK GDPR regulations um, have got particular standards which are used. And I think if you're concerned, well, you should be concerned about data security, but um, if you're thinking about that, then they're the standards that um, you should be looking at. I don't have the actual codes uh, to hand with me at the moment, mm -hmm. but it's something that we can look up and we'll post uh, the relevant regulations on the, uh, on the website as we released all the information on this. Several people have asked about specific system, uh, naming specific systems um, and you know, which system would be particularly appropriate for a, a low, um, a low resourced laboratory. I'm not sure that we should uh, today be um, advertising for particular manufacturers or providers. Um, but again, I wonder, so um, Musa, you're using, are yours, is your system an in-house system that you're using? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I don't know, John and Pacome, have you got direct experience of systems that you're using in your settings? Um, in Zambia, we use uh, the limb system um, that the uh, CIDRS um, uh, laboratory uses, that's the CDC laboratory. Um, they they uh, came up with the limb system in, to the market, so that's the one we've been using. I'm not sure what the actual name of the software is. Uh, I'm trying to look it up right now. 
and I'll type it into the group. Um, so uh, just give me a few. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, Pacom, how about you? Have you got direct experience? Pacom has disappeared on us. So I think Pacom might be working with the Diaza system from uh, South Africa that we're that we've been working with. Um, there's a further question about again focusing on LIMS systems. Um, there's some questions around clinical trials and LIMS systems. Uh, Musa, do you have an experience of that? Oh, um, I would say that uh, actually in IPD, we are using this, uh, this um, Teranga ecosystem for also uh, the different clinical trials we are, we are expected to make. Uh, so uh, I would say that uh, it's a question of, it's a, it's a term of question you are actually uh, wanting to answer, but uh, as I say, I'm not really a specialist of that, but what we're using actually in IPD is also the Gisteranga uh, ecosystem, which is also involved in the, in the clinical trials uh, actually in course. Maybe what I can do is to, to, to see if uh, the, the informatic teams involved here, and maybe why not share more, um, I would say more information about this point. Uh, using the email or something like that, if yeah, you don't that's, mind. Well, that, that's great. That's great, Musa. We could perhaps do that, put a, that information on the, uh, the website associated with these presentations for people to access. Sure. I, I, I do have some experience. Sure. Of, thank, thanks, Musa. We do have a, a UCL and across the, the Panacea network do have experience of introducing limb systems associated with clinical trials. And as I think some of the, um, in, in the chat, some people have pointed out that the sponsors for the trials will often have prerequisites um, for the limb system so that it interacts with their data management, their data systems for the clinical trials. So limb systems are very good in the clinical trial setting because they remove or they minimize the need for um, data entry. So you can link them up directly to your machinery and um, capture that data without the, the risk of somebody having to transcribe the information. Of course, if you're doing microscopy or anything with a manual readout, then that, that still does need um, verification. So there's, there's a, an enthusiasm for using limb systems to feed directly into the clinical trials data systems. Um, but these this often presents some uh, software and uh, data and uh, programming issues which need to be resolved. And that brings us back to a question that was asked at the very beginning of uh, your talk about with the element with, about limbs, uh, Musa, which was somebody quite rightly asked about the validation of limb systems. And of course, like any process in the laboratory, you, need to, you do need to validate your limb system. Musa, do you have any thoughts on how we how we how we would go about validating a, a limbs? Okay, so what our the way is to compare the old way, I would say. So um, when you have a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of ex um, lot of manual entry in your previous database, you are able to be to compare uh, the, the different parameters like, I mean, the time for for, for handling the, the samples. So you are, what we have is to compare the performance in terms of, uh, of uh, human errors, basically, as I said, the representation, the, the, the time of processing the samples, the entry, the time for, for perform the, all the, the dynamic, dynamic cycles. So you just make a simple comparison between what you done, what you did uh, before and after the limbs inter, uh, integration. So it's basically like that. So. Uh, typically, uh, the first person we, uh, which can say that there is a really progress of uh, the technical lab stuff and they say that, oh yeah, we see that uh, now, right now it's really, really easy to, to, to handle our, 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 our job. So mainly the best way we do, it can take maybe five years to be, to implement uh, 
a good limbs because you need to compare before and be sure that uh, it's really uh, it's really uh, a good a good tool for your, your your lab so you need to compare basically what you did before and see with indicators so that's why you need previously a quality system management to be sure that you have the specific indicators when with uh, the, the old fashion uh, way compared to the uh, to what you do with the, the, the actual leads so firstly i would say you need to get a quality system uh, to be sure that you have the different indicator for the when you do the manual i would say the manual uh, manual <coughs> job after that, you should be able to compare uh, these indicators with those obtained using the, the limbs. Yes, so that's, I would say that I think that this is the, the more, these are the most, uh, the best way to, to, be, to be confident about the, the, the quality of your limbs. Thank, thank you, Musa. And I think we could have we could spend a lot more time discussing limbs. It might be food for a further workshop. Actually, there's such a lot to think about in setting those up. Um, we're, it's, it's now just about ten o'clock. So, but I'm going. To, we're, I'll cover a couple of the more general questions that were asked before we move on to the next section, because I think your presentation deserves the opportunity for people to to discuss. There's been um, a couple. Of, a couple of questions around the uh, around the BSL three setting, and um, one of those is who who is allowed to use or work in a BSL three laboratory. So who is allowed stroke qualified? So I have views on that, but uh, I'd prefer to hear your views, uh, Musa, and then perhaps we'll try and bring uh, John in. I know Pakum's having difficulty with his uh, his connection, so. Musa, do you have thoughts on how you approve people to use the BSL-3 facility? All right, that's a good question too. So um, actually we need, uh, also we, we, we are coming back to the quality uh, and uh, I would say uh, hygiene and quality and security system. So as you know, you should in, have in your lab or in your institute, uh, HQE uh, system when you are able to uh, to I would say to to evaluate people to have specific um, I would say to have specific uh, uh, course uh, involving the, 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 the biosafety measures which can be uh, known which should be known by the different by, by the lab by, by the lab staff so yes what we do actually in IPD, so everyone we should, we have, we should be habilitated to, to enter in a biosel free should have a formation of one month and a half. And, and after that, you have an exam and you should have a specific uh, a score to be, have, to be able to get a, to, to pass the theoretical uh, exam. And after that, you need a practical aspect of particular sessions of about uh, one month again. So it's very uh, a hard and very strict uh, part of this, uh, of this formation before be, uh, being able to, to go in the BSL tree. After that, you need to be, uh, uh, to be used to manipulate with a mentor. So definitely you need also to, to have very, uh, to have experts which are able to share their expertise, of course, and you need a quality check of uh, with specific indicators. Uh, uh, with so we need standards to be able to assess if people is ready to 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 to, to enter in the BSL three because, as you know, it's really uh, sensitive to 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 work in this kind of uh, in this kind of uh, uh, containment uh, level room. So basically, yeah, you need uh, actually a typical formation with a typical group yeah, in your thank, institute. Thanks, Musa. John, do you have any comments on uh, on this? Um, yeah, so to work in a BSL-3 laboratory, um, there should be like, there should be a specific uh, protocol uh, established in the lab as to who gets access and how you train up whoever is going to get access to the BSL-3 
um, facilities. Um, in obviously, you know, there um, there are videos you can download um, that you know show you like the basic operations of a BSO three uh, laboratory and like what you're supposed to, what you can and cannot do in the hood. So um, in Zambart, uh, which was a, a, a TB uh, project, they use BSL3 uh, laboratories. Um, they had like a specific training video everyone had to watch. And then you would go through a training session um, with uh, someone in the BSL3 lab. And in your first um, few times using the lab, you'd be shadowed uh, by a more experienced uh, uh, laboratory person. So that's basically what I would um, 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 say for using the BSL until you know you are judged to be of competency that you wouldn't make any mistake in the BSL three facility. So uh, that that's what I would say on that. Yeah, no, I thanks, thanks, John. I I agree. I mean, in our in our laboratories, we have a competence assessment process, and um, that process um, takes into account the the initial training of the of the person and then they them achieving competence in a in a certain range of skills and also knowledge of of the issues involved and i think it's important these vary from site to site and from country to country so there's no one um one size fits all model but it is about a competence which is appropriate to that um there's one it's now uh, almost five past ten, so we should be moving on. But there's one more question that um, is interesting. Um, well, um, actually, there's two questions I'm, I'm going to ask uh, from the chat box. There's the first one is it's almost a trick question uh, that somebody's asked. So where do glove boxes fit into the uh, BS BSL categorization process? So Musa. You can see why I think that's a trick question. What What's your thoughts on that? How do they? How do you account, account for glo fit glove boxes into the categorization of your laboratories? So sorry, I'm not sure to get you. You know the glove boxes, which are designed for um, containment of uh, organisms, and they're used. They can be used in a mobile setting, so they don't really fit into the BSL. So somebody's asked how they how they fit into oh, the yeah. categorization. So what do you think about that? I think it's a trick. Okay, question. that's a good question. Yes, that's a really, really good question. A really trick question because, uh, as you know, yeah, this glow box was uh, used for even for Ebola outbreaks and. We don't have sometimes uh, all the different, uh, the different, um, I would say, uh, filtration or all the airlock we, now, we, we we should have in the typical uh, BSL four and of course and even in some BSL three. But I will say that it's a kind of BSL three point five if you if you allow me, because actually uh, it's allowed. Um, uh, as a BSL, uh, a BSL3 and MSC3 uh, to to manage with a product which is handled by uh, a, a flexible, uh, I will say, flexible sleeves uh, and invisible with gloves, and also your environment is protected, uh, even if it's only physical sometimes, and you have also the, the filters in uh, which are very very uh, tight we have and we have also there is no contact in, of the internal part of the cabinet with the laboratory air so uh, but also you are not in typically in the bsl4 but you can manage to be like, like that if you were your own ppe so, but that's why i would say so it's close it's between bsl3 and bsl4 and it's uh, it's a good uh, option when you are in a very uh, remote area, and so yeah, definitely you can manage to it, it, you can manage uh, even uh, very dangerous uh, pathogen with this uh, with this, uh, this kind of uh, glove box. But you need to be perfectly uh, trained, perfectly trained before uh, before going through before before using them. Uh, so I will say 3.5, uh, but very close to uh, a BSL3 because you are only use them for diagnostic, not for other kind of, uh, I would say, cultural and this kind of thing. Over. 
Thank, thanks, Miss. Yeah, I agree. They're, they're really a compromise, aren't they? Because in, in, in order you to undertake diagnostics um, processes in a setting where you don't have a full BSL-4 facility. So thank you for that. I, th I think, um, okay, so there's one final question and that's about contingency planning. And it's a, and the question came, how often do you revisit your contingency plan? So you've quite rightly said you should revisit your contingency plan. Do you do that on a, a regular basis or do you have some triggers to, to do that? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good good question. So I think that I I pointed uh, during the, the 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 presentation. So as you said, the contingency contingency plan is uh, a very uh, it's a part of risk assessment. So when we see when you detect any changes uh, during the in the lab, when you have new stuff, when you have new uh, I would say new uh, evolution. Uh, of your your environment, when you have uh, any uh, modification of your your ecosystems, you should make an, a contingency plan. So it's a way to to to, to update uh, your 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 contingency plans when necessary. It's not a, a periodical, I would say, a periodical uh, way. I would say that it's depending of how evolved your 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 lab or your institute. So uh, what would trigger the contingency plan is if you have any uh, evolution of your situations uh, comparing to the previous uh, time when you, 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 you built your, your, your first plan. So that's why um, it's depending on how evolve your, your situation in your lab or in your institute. Thanks, thanks, Musa. I think we should draw a draw a line there. I'm conscious that you need to get on to your to another task as well. So, um, so Musa, thank you. Um, I second the. I, some while ago, somebody put in the chat. Uh, this was an thank awesome you. presentation. So, uh, and thank you for that uh, overview of of the process. So, thank you very much.